Zenith goes lightweight, Piaget goes back in time, plus we get caught in some trademark troubles. All this and more on today's episode of the show. Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. If this is your first time, then check our show notes. There will be a link in the description of this video. Click that, that'll take you across to a web page on our website. They'll tell you all the details you want to know, all the behind the scenes pictures, technical spec, pricing information, and links to buy these things if you actually like them. Following the hot in the heels of LVMH week, where tons of new releases came out from all the brands within that stable. And uh, we ran into a little bit of difficulty, kind of halfway through, but we'll get to that in a second. But one of the watches that caught my attention was from Zenith, and it was a super lightweight titanium number. The Chrono Master Sport was an overnight success a couple of years ago when it was first launched. Then it came out in precious metal. Then it came out in tricolor bezel arrangements. And it's always been one of those watches that's been either waitlisted or in high demand. Something that Zenith has not been used to over the years. And with a change of the guard at the top end quite recently, with Julian Turner moving on to become the CEO of TAG, there's a new guy at the helm, and this is kind of the first release with him kind of figureheading things. Obviously, he wasn't as much involved in the creation process, because that would have been done over the past couple of years. But I'm liking the look of this. I'm actually liking the look of a lot of the Zenith watches, and looking forward to seeing them when we get to watch the wonders. So you've had a quick look at this one. What are your thoughts? The Chronomasters are a watch that, when introduced to the Zenith range, you know, took a few folk by surprise. Maybe got compared to a watch from another large brand. Maybe overly so, but I think it looks pretty different. Obviously, with stainless steel and precious metal, it was a matter of time, of course, before they brought out a titanium one. And sure enough, they have a grade 5 titanium version here. Quite subdued. Obviously, lots of those titanium colours, those greys. Uh, the subdials on this watch are an area where they've quite often played with colour or shading differences. And on this, you've got these kind of different variations of anthracites and greys. The watch is a good bit lighter. Titanium bracelet on there as well, albeit there is an option for rubber bracelets. And what I have to say is I'm quite impressed. They haven't decided to pump the price up just because it's titanium fractionally more expensive, I think a few hundred dollars. So not ludicrous in terms of price uplift. I think this is a watch that's been crying out to be made in titanium and I really like what they've done with this. Yeah, and it was Rolex with a watch that people said looked quite familiar myself included, especially that bracelet and clasp. But this one here is obviously a lot less expensive and it follows hot in the heels of tons of other great releases, as we mentioned. And we won't have time to go through all the LVMH Watch Week stuff. We weren't there. We were busy doing other stuff. But we did have a roving reporter, Barbara Palumbo. What's on her wrist? She was across. She got to check out everything in real life. And she will be coming on to do a specific show about her recent travels. She went across to Italy for Vicenza Oro. I didn't go there either. And we may have a special guest. Somebody might be holding her hand. Somebody else from Italy might be on that show to kind of guide her through those two events. But we did mention that we ran into a little bit of trouble with trademarks. And yeah, this was something that happened to us and we heard afterwards it happened to a number of other folks. But as all these new watches were being released, Barbara was sending us pictures, we sent them across to Maziel, he was updating the website, he was updating the Instagram and we were keeping an eye on things. Then out of nowhere, we got a, what would you call it, a counterfeit and trademark strike on our Instagram. And we wondered what was going on. Because the pictures that we were posting were from LVMH week. We'd tagged LVMH, we'd tagged whichever brand it was. But for some reason, this got blocked. And we went back to Barbara and we asked, well, what went on here? What's the problem? And she said, well, I was given permission by all the brands to take photos. And I always ask, I don't break embargoes. And whenever there's a question... I will ask, is this watch out just now? Is it okay to cover it? And if she's told no, then she actually makes a note in her phone where she takes the photos that this is the embargo date. And she gets the person to record a little video clip ahead of time to say, this is when it's released. Keeps everybody right. But anyway, we got that strike and I went through this laborious process of trying to unpick the mess by contacting Instagram because they email you, you put a code in, they email you again, then you have to send a documentary evidence that this is not counterfeit. So I did all that. Then we got another strike later on. Then we got another strike. And I think in total, before we went through the entire collection of Scottish Watches posts of the last year and deleted every LVMH watch, Zenith, Hublot, Tag, everything. Everything went, including Genta stuff, because we just kept getting them. And it was posts we'd made a couple of months ago. 
and then it was three months ago. So no idea what went on there. We tried to contact everybody we know that communicates with LVMH. So in the UK, it is our press guys at LMC. They had no clue what was going on. Spoke to our contact at Zenith, and it was actually her that managed to find out that this has happened to a few people. So no idea if it's a little bit of AI gone rogue, or if the litigious folks in the lawyer's office at LVMH are just cracking down on stuff. I did hear a couple of years ago that Cartier did something similar where they were taking down posts on Instagram and other social media channels. But that was one thing. Then we spotted something else. And it was Rich at Studio Underdog who had spotted something else. He'd spotted there were some players on the Alibabas and the AliExpresses who were homaging his watch. Dave, do you know about this one? I think he took it in great stead. Uh, He did a little bit of an Instagram live just introducing the fact that he, a small brand in the UK, which sure enough within the watch community has got a bit of traction and people are well aware of Rich and his colourful watches, but unbelievably someone has taken it upon themselves to homage, not even homage, I think it's probably more an outright copy of his watch. And it shows you the world we live in when a watch that is a mere £550 from the official source begins to get homaged at not that really a different price to what you can buy a real one for. What a world we live in. But Rich has taken it very much tongue in cheek and he has taken it upon himself to maybe do a copy of a copy of a copy of his watch just for good fun. So yeah, I think Rich taking it very much in the stead that he has to take it, as I guess trying to take that fight to an unknown source in the Far East might be problematic for a small business, but Rich really taking the opportunity to have a bit of a laugh and a joke about the whole situation. So yeah, I look forward to seeing what he comes up with as a homage of an homage. In comedy circles, Rich plays the straight man very well and he does it with such candor and tongue-in-cheekness that it is impressive to watch his little instagram videos his reels and his youtube videos and uh, what it seems to have happened here is somebody has copied the design but badly they've taken the basics they've taken the color scheme and kind of thrown it onto a dial and they've used the same movement underneath which is ridiculous it's a shitty version and the problem is if you go into aliexpress and you type in studio underdog you get all kinds of really dodgy looking clothing for animals Go and check yourself. So yeah, I actually had to look on there and type in watermelon watch and it was hideous. And as you say, it was a couple of hundred bucks when you can get the full thing for 500. There was that one. So we had our little LVMH troubles. We had the Studio Underdog copy. And then a listener to the show emailed in to say, have you seen this thing? And I looked at it and thought, oh, there's a mad too. The guys at MBNF have done something. They've updated things. And then I looked a little bit closer and it was a different brand. And then I looked even closer and I thought, hold on, that's that's a rip-off of the mad one. Somebody had blatantly, as in some Chinese companies, have blatantly ripped off the, the Land Rover Evoque, they've ripped off the Bentleys, they've ripped off the Rolls Royces. Some brand has ripped everything off to the point where, at a casual glance, I made a meme about it, I made the Spider-Man meme where he puts his glasses on and he sees what it really is. At a casual glance, it looks like the same thing. It was just crazy how this is all happening right now. There's a lot of uh, people out there not doing so much hard work, more just doing the copy and paste, control C and washing something out, hoping to make some money, which is a bit of a sad state of affairs. You know, I think it's only right that these brands protect themselves in any way that they can, if, if, if in fact they are able to, or with the likes of Rich just poking fun at it and seeing where that takes him on his creative journeys. So yeah, interesting. We'll see. I'm sure there's going to be more of that coming. Uh, It's a tough market we're in just now, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And with that one there that I mentioned, the guy seems to be in the UK and he was using Kickstarter, which is an American company, and they have got intellectual property laws in place. In China, it's a little bit harder to prosecute and put a damper on things. But apparently the dampers have been put on this one, and for good reason, because it was an absolute rip off copy. Uh, the movement may have been different, but everything else, the lugs, the shape, the case, the colour, the <laughs> the actual striping on the movement, everything matched. And yeah, 
In the eyes of the law, that's passing off and it would cause confusion with the public about who made it and all the rest of it. So yeah, good riddance to that one. And we forgot to say, if you're actually watching us on YouTube, you're kind of missing half the story. Every week we put out two episodes. One is me and Dave, which we usually put on YouTube quite quickly. And then we have an interview with a collector, a brand, a watchmaker, a designer, or just somebody that's into watches. And those are the episodes that we don't generally put on YouTube because we don't have the time. Although Gav is working behind the scenes to kind of catch up on things. So if you want to hear more of us with people that actually know what they're talking about, go on to Spotify, go on to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Amazon Podcasts, SoundCloud, wherever podcasts are played and you'll find us there. Subscribe and you can listen. You also get more information because there's parts of the show on YouTube that get deleted because we run out of time and you can catch all the flavour, all the details and all the behind the scenes stuff in the audio podcast. And what should we talk about next, Dave? Recreations is what I think we should talk about. Legal ones this time, Dave? Correct. These are ones being done by the company who actually made the original in the first place. So I think if anyone is allowed to do a recreation, it's their own brand. We've had, obviously, Omega with the 321, which has been reimagined really faithfully with the Ed White. We've had Vacheron, who have re-established the 222 back into popular demand after many years of being out of the range. And who do we have now? We have Piaget coming along with the Polo 1979 or the Polo 79. And again, very much like the Vacheron 222, a 1970s, 1980s watch, gold, very gaudy, very much of its moment in time, disappeared from the range as it was really not that fashionable and it's come back hard and strong. And I have really been taken by a few of these kind of reinterpretations of watches. With this, no mistake, I like it. Very different. Would I wear it? Probably not. Would I like to have one on my wrist to try it out? Absolutely. Now, this is a watch that Myself and Ricky spent a bit of time at the Piaget stand at Watches and Wonders last year and we saw some really cool watches. Not watches I don't think that either of us would naturally buy or wear, but it was great fun handling them and the quality of their precious metal work is unbelievable. A bit like the 222, not a watch for those of shallow pockets coming in at around the €80,000 mark, including taxes, so definitely a considered purchase on this one, but a big solid lump of gold, it has to be said, with that Piaget micro rotor movement in there as well, which I believe they are calling one of the thinnest micro rotor movements in the marketplace today, coming in at just under three millimetres thick, which is a pretty solid feat of engineering, it has to be said. What size is the Haraj version? The Haraj micro rotor movement is currently in and around the 3.5 millimetre size. Get the hammer out. Get the hammer out. We will flatten that. Road rollers. There's that YouTube channel, you know, the hydraulic press guys, you know. <clears throat> Perfect. We only need a fraction of a millimetre and we're bang on it. We can we can call out a world record. Bring it to Scotland where it's cold. Everything kind of shrinks in the cold. Allegedly. Well, I mean... Allegedly. It's already small. It's not small. It's just far away. They have increased the size. So the original was 34 millimetre. They've lifted up to 38 millimetre, which I think is very much of the moment. 34 maybe it's slightly small for most contemporary wrist sizes. I would also say the other thing they've done, which I'm not sure whether I do or don't like, is they've moved the case back crown to a more conventional crown. But with the 38 millimetre size, it definitely carries it a little better than it would do on that smaller watch. Very much like this, lots of the detail and finishing and the gold work. One thing I definitely remember from handling a Piaget last year with a solid gold bracelet was... Whilst being very flexible and wearable, it felt almost like it was one piece, even though it wasn't. And everything from looking at the pictures of this watch, because we haven't seen this in real life, but I'm sure come watches and wonders, we will get to handle it. It just has that same feel and look about it that I think it's going to feel pretty hefty and really solid, but being super comfortable on the wrist. In and around 200 grams without the bracelet being cut, so it is a fairly weighty proposition on the wrist. Yeah, I definitely think this is a pretty cool looking watch. Other brands like Bulgari also bringing back some of those 1970s, 1980s gold watches. Seems to be a bit of a vibe. That whole gold thing is coming back. I like it, I have to say. It means I get to wear my Speedmaster more and not stick out like a sore thumb. Not sure if this is your bag, but I could possibly see you with your all black garb on Ricky wearing a Bobby Dazzler gold watch. I've thought about it. I've got a gold colour G-Shock limited edition thing, 6900 series that I never wear because I've got too many watches. 
Uh, this one, I do like the look of it, but it reminds me of the Gucci film, House of Gucci, that came out a few years ago, and obviously it's not a Gucci watch, but that kind of styling, that time frame, yeah, it's nice, I would never buy it, even if it was plated or capped at a less expensive price, not for me, although I do have a couple of dress watches now, but uh, it's something that maybe in their, both our futures could be another Snoopy, because there is a rumour going around that the guys at Swatch they were quite happy when they did the moon swatch. That was a bit of a success. It's still a runaway success. Hard to get a hold of still to this day. Certain models of it. And then they did the Blompon. The 50 Fathoms. The, the kind of collab. The scuba. And all the rest of it. That one didn't work out quite as well. So they've kind of gone back a little bit into the fold with Omega. Allegedly. And they're working on something that could be a Snoopy. Have you heard anything official? Is this all kind of rumour stuff at the moment? Definitely rumours. And I believe this might be a little bit of a misguiding on some people. Obviously, they put a bit of an Instagram post up with a little Snoopy and a moon swatch and folk honestly jumped straight on it. It must be happening. It must be happening. But then it went quiet. And then there was the news of the box sets that are going to be auctioned, or I think they are either just have been or are coming up in auctions for these box sets going to a charitable cause. And I wonder if maybe it's a little bit of guiding towards that as opposed to an actual Snoopy release. But who knows, if they do a Snoopy release compared to the Moonshine versions that they've done, I think it will go absolutely pandemonium at the shops again, back to the early days of the Moon Swatch hype. But we will see. I remain to be seen as it's gone very quiet. I think we would have heard more about this watch if it was going to be a real thing by now. But who knows? Who knows what they've got up their sleeve? Because I don't think anyone thought that they would get the hype they have over the last couple of years with these watches, but they surely have. I think if this is a real thing, they will drop it just at Watches and Wonders time because Watch Group aren't involved in that. That's Richemont, LVMH and various independents. And I think they could really throw a cat among the pigeons if they are going to do something. And it was around about Watches and Wonders time two years ago, March, April that the first moon swatch came out so it wouldn't be out of kilter if they did that uh, and speaking of an inexpensive watch that potentially may come out to an inexpensive watch that definitely did come out and this isn't a Hodinkee limited edition we spoke about the Ed Sheeran that came out again a Casio G-Shock 6900 series in yellow that I really quite like the look of didn't need any more watches though of that shape or style and we commented afterward that it didn't sell out instantly it didn't sell out in a week didn't sell out in a month still hasn't sold out I checked a few weeks ago and you could still actually go to the Hodinkee website and buy this thing. So I think the wheels came off the whole Hodinkee wagon a little bit. So instead of using the Hodinkee name, they've now used the Ben Clymer name, which is a little bit odd to me. What's your thoughts on this? Has it come as a surprise? Not particularly. Obviously, Ben Clymer being the masthead of Hodinkee pretty much since it, well not pretty much, since its inception and although the business has gone through multiple changes and kind of different looks and feels, he is still very much involved. So am I surprised that they have done a Hodinkee Ben Clymer G-Shock? Not in the slightest. Do I like it? Not really, I have to be honest. I've not been a huge fan of really any of the Hodinkee G-Shock releases. I'm a big G-Shock fan. Just none of them have really vibed too much with me. Did you not like the first John Mayer one that looked like kind of Yamaha classic Casio classic keyboard? Can't say Yamaha or Casio keyboard. Well, to be honest, no, not really. It didn't do my vibe. I know a few friends that did get their hands on them. Big John Mayer fans to be said, but no, didn't really do my thing. Of all three, the Ed Sheeran and the Yellow is of the three my favourite of those three. But even I didn't uh, push the boat out and go for one of those ones. This one is one of my favourite shapes of G-Shock, has to be said. Quite like the fact they've got a custom backlight on it with a little Hadinky logo on there. Mm, I just feel it doesn't kind of flow for me. Not really my vibe, all a bit too heavily customised and heavily Hadinkied for my liking. But yeah, I'm sure they will sell some. I think it seems that the hype has gone out of the whole Hadinky sphere. So let's see how it actually does my betting is it doesn't sell out. At least with John Mayer, he's a massive music star, so he has a fan base there, unlike, I think, Ben Clymer. You say that, the Ed Sheeran didn't sell out, and Ed Sheeran has got more popularity worldwide, I would predict. But what's that? What's that I can hear in the distance? Is that Australian Tears? That Andrew McCutcheon didn't decide to put his name in his own watch first? Oh dear. Get your finger out, Andrew. 
We don't want Time and Tide anymore. We want McCutcheon specials and we want it spelled the way you spell it. Probably time to talk about things we've been up to. I decided it was time to renew my passport. But when you're travelling pretty much every single month, picking a time frame where you can renew your passport and it's going to come back and you're not going to get caught short with some travel on the agenda is tricky. So I thought, second week in January, let's see what happens. But it's been nearly 10 years since I last updated it, and they obviously changed the rules and the regulations along the way. And I spotted that you now don't even have to go to your local Timsons or your Jessops or wherever to have a photograph taken to use. You can do it yourself. You can upload it yourself. And I thought, perfect, I have a multitude of cameras here, so I'll do this. So I set the camera up, took the photo, uploaded it, and it's got this little chart thing that kind of says red to green if it's a good picture or it's not a good picture. And it said it was a bad picture. And I thought, but it's exactly what you asked for. It's got the white background and all the rest of it. And it said no. So I looked at the examples and I thought, hmm. So what I did was I copied and pasted the example picture in Photoshop and then I cut around my own head. And I put it on the little picture. And then I uploaded that and it said it was fine. Last time I renewed my passport, which was around 18 months to 24 months ago, I took my own pictures. And as far as I could see, everything matched the requirements. And the software said, no go. Computer says no. Even tried a little bit of Photoshop manipulation as you did. And it was a bit better, but still didn't want to play. So what did I do? I ended up going to Timpsons. Got the crappiest photo you can possibly imagine. Bob's your uncle quite happy it accepted it straight away so hey who knows but governments you know they do what they want anyway so yes they got my money timpson's got their 20 pounds for taking my photo and i wasted all my good camera equipment but hey ho you know i got a passport and i don't need to do it for at least another eight years yeah and i've got a picture of myself wearing a stone island jacket that i don't own amazing film wise there's been a ton i have gone through but i'm going to cast everybody's mind back to a film that it isn't one i've just recently seen dave don't worry it's one i saw ages ago when it first came out and then i revisited it and this is from the very late 90s i think it was 1999 slightly before or slightly after when the matrix came out and it shares quite a number of themes this one's called the 13th floor and it's about living within a simulation, one of Elon Musk's favourite things to talk about. And it is just as good as I remember it. It is so well put together. It's almost like one of the Moriarty episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, but in long form. And there's some great actors in there that you watch and go, wow, didn't expect to see them. Definitely a film of the 90s. Some of the things they do, some of the things they say, it pigeonholes it right there and then. But great story. I will not ruin it. It's very Inception, it's very Matrix, and it's a little bit of a cult classic now. So what's Dave been up to? What happened at GP? What's Dave been up to? So yeah, Dave's main event has been, he was at the Girard Perigo event that I talked about earlier. So as I mentioned, it's the first time that Girard Perigo have had an official presence in Scotland, and it's a brand that have been slowly but surely kind of gaining in stature and notoriety in terms of the modern watch environment. A brand that's been around for many years, closely linked with Ulysse Narda and obviously with Don Scadra, one of the most famous makers of Grand Fu enamel dials in the Swiss industry. And these guys have been doing the Laureato, obviously the Casquette, and as we saw at Dubai Watch Week, the Three Bridges, and they've done the recent collaboration with Aston Martin, as I think the third or fourth Aston Martin collaboration. So nice to see those guys up. They had various people from the brand themselves, from Switzerland, over talking about the brand, showing some pieces, and they brought with them a few more unusual pieces, such as that Three Bridges Aston Martin collaboration watch as well. Really well turned out, and I have to say, Mapper and Webb have done a wonderful job of reinvigorating that store in Glasgow. A pretty iconic building with a very, very nice staircase, it has to be said. So yeah, very nicely hosted by those guys, and great to see a bunch of people. We had Sarah, the Duchess of Watches, she made an appearance, and she was being a bit of a social butterfly getting herself around talking to everybody which was very unlike Sarah she was in a very upbeat mood it has to be said so lovely to see her amongst many other of our friends and sometimes when Dave is busy doing his monologue and I've heard it all before I go on the internet and have a look around and look at this finely crafted watch which signifies status and achievement how beautiful is that I think I need that in my life definitely I think yep. you do and next up, we have an email in from a listener that wants to come to Watchmakers Day here in the UK. This is an event we've been talking about at length for months. And people were saying, eh, we'll get it. We'll order our tickets in the, the near future. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Well, tough shit. It's all sold out now. 
<laughs> but we have had a couple of emails in from people asking some questions. And Dave, you can go with this one here. Hi, both. I, like many others, am really looking forward to the Alliance British Watchmakers Day on Saturday 9th of March. And I have my free ticket for the morning session, courtesy of my Alliance membership and my general ticket for the afternoon. Happy days. I'm planning on making a weekend of it. And so on the Sunday, would like to fill my day with watch related activity if possible. Whilst a walk down Bond Street to see the high end boutiques would be nice. Frankly, I don't want to be made to feel like a meaningless turd. So I'll give that a miss. But Dave, as a man who I know has spent a lot of time in London and a man in the know, do you have any suggestions of where I should go? I was thinking maybe IWC Battersea, but I'm just wondering what else might be worth a look. Many thanks, Mark Jones. So indeed, Mark, there is many, many places you can go to visit in London. The IWC boutique over at Battersea is definitely well worth dropping into because aside from seeing IWC, Battersea Power Station is a pretty impressive piece of architecture that has been rejuvenated from a derelict and defunct power station into a retail emporium of stature. And it's just lovely to walk around it. You have the Swatch Boutique, you have Omega, you have various other brands in there as well, amongst many other retail establishments. So yes, I would suggest that. I would go for a walk up through Burlington Arcade, you will see some absolutely ludicrously priced pre-owned watches, but you'll see some rare stuff as well. And towards the very top, you will see Somlos, a place where if you like your vintage Omegas and or vintage Patek and various other unusual pieces, you'll see some really rare and unusual little watches and accoutrements that may whet your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Next up, the guys at Moser. They're good. They invited us out. They took us over to Schaffhausen last year and we didn't really know what the hell we were doing going over there. But we thought, well, Ed and the crew, they know what they're doing. We went over. We looked at the museum. Loved it. Didn't think I would. We went on a factory tour. Loved it. Didn't think I would. Did some cool stuff with Ed later on. Loved it. Didn't expect to do that either. But they've been doing tons of stuff behind the scenes. And it's not just dicking around with watches anymore. They're dicking around with larger mechanical objects. They have announced their partnership with Alpine Motorsports, one of the big players both in Formula One and in endurance racing. A brand who maybe for many people outside Europe might not be overly familiar with, but a French brand of some renown from the 1960s and 70s with some very trendy sports cars, the Alpine 110 being one of them. Who's the brand behind it? Has it been brought back? by one of the big French mobs. So Alpine, a company who have been inextricably linked with Renault and obviously Renault have had their time in Formula 1 as well. As a brand Alpine back in the 70s were kind of subsumed into Renault and into Renault Sport. It then ceased to be used as a badge right up until the brand kind of came back to life in 2017 and since then Renault Sport's been pulled back into and it's now the Alpine division so Alpine is essentially the sporting division of Renault so you have both their Formula 1 team programme and you also have their endurance programme and their little sports cars that they make under the Alpine badging again a bit of a blast from the past and it has to be said, an interesting combination. Nice to see Moser getting themselves into this sphere. Obviously, lots of other brands have associations with motorsport. You have the likes of Ferrari and Richard Mille. You have Aston Martin and Gerard Perigo, as we mentioned just earlier in this show. And obviously, IWC with Mercedes AMG. And we now have Moser joining in, not just with the Formula One team, but with the entire Alpine racing portfolio as well. So yes, no watches have yet been announced in collaboration with this. Don't even know if there necessarily will be a special watch, but you will see the Moser name on Alpine racing cars. So nice to see Edward and all of the gang there at Moser doing something that I'm sure is close to their heart. And this is part of the show where I don't usually do a wrist check, but I wanted to give a bit of an update on a watch that I've had for a number of years, and it comes from Dave's bosses. So before we cut to Pietro, who is an actual genuine watch expert, instead of me and Dave that are just playing at it, I wanted to do a quick wrist check, and it is my Raj Tourbillon 1, a watch I've had for two and a bit years, nearly two and a quarter, two and a half years, and it came on a leather strap, which I immediately changed for a Tropic Rubber. But the guys announced and then released this crazy looking metal bracelet, which is actually perfectly matched because of that grid arrangement on the dial there. It wasn't specifically for the Tourbillon 1, it was to coincide with the Tourbillon 2 release, 
but they made the case shape the same where the logs actually connect to the bracelet and the strap so it looks ideal on this and as you would expect it matches perfectly and it has got a great clasp and this has got the first clasp that with this kind of arrangement here with the buoyant butterfly that does not dig in and slice my wrist I actually take a file to the back of most of the butterfly clasps to file it down a little bit because it is so sharp even the Moser and with this one no not at all didn't have to dick about with it whatsoever so really happy with it totally changes up the look of the watch and as always guys at Raj doing great things apart from employing Dave unfortunately everyone has to have a bad day so this is the part of the show where we bring Pietro on he has got a box of tricks he has sent him well, I was going to say it was a selection box but Christmas is well out of the way you can see the background the festivities are definitely in the past and Pietro is going to explain all we're going to pick the big heavy hitting number to start with first of all I'm going to show everyone what we're about to talk about and as you can see on the desk here we have got an absolute killer selection of different watches different styles and different price points but we're going to go for the middle number here which is the Chipek because it's a brand that I know a little bit about I've met the guys a number of times across the world in different places Xavier has been on the show he has entertained he has delighted us with his accent and you can tell us all about the watch that I have got here just now in front of me yes controversially I wanted to show you uh, because I haven't done before and we've talked a lot about the Antarctic, which was the massive success that Ch Chapek uh, have managed to create over the last couple of years. But we have not talked enough, uh, perhaps, Ricky, you and I, um, about this uh, Kederberg, which is really the DNA and the essence of uh, the Chapek brand, because we can call Chapek a brand as opposed to, you know, obviously a solo watchmaker, a brand generated by a solo watchmaker who was uh, Francois Chapek in the uh, middle of the 19th century. But the Kederberg is iconic, is an important watch, and actually seals the debut of Chapek in 2015 uh, when uh, Chapek was launched. They immediately got the uh, Grand Prix de l'Orangerie Award on a similar timepiece, which was the Kederberg with, uh, with a white dial in that case. In this case here, the watch you are uh, playing with is actually the Kederberg uh, Emerald Green a more recent uh, edition that has been uh, launched by Chapek that uh, is equipped with a proprietary SXH wine uh, manual winding um, uh, caliber, which beats at 21,600 vibrations per hour. And uh, it's got a case dimension of 42.5 millimeters with a, with a height of uh, um, a little short of uh, 12 millimeters. So a very, uh, I would say, uh, it blinks an eye to the classic codes of uh, watchmaking, but it definitely has a twist with this um, really, really cool see-through on this uh, caliber that uh, doesn't doesn't stop marveling me uh, every time I, I wear, for example, the, the Kede bag. The architecture of the case is very interesting as well. You can see it's in, in, on multi-dimensions. Um, the case on the side is slightly, um, uh, is worked in different ways. Uh, so there are some hollow parts in uh, in the direction of the of the lugs, as well as uh, like uh, fake pushes protecting the crown, and on the other side you can uh, you can linger and appreciate the uh, uh, yeah the hollow um, uh, section of the case itself, which is worked with a different finishing, which is more satin rather than mirror polished, and uh, as uh, you can see the uh, both the case back and uh, and the bezel are actually mirror polished. Yeah, this is a better view on the dial. The dial presents a uh, guilloche, engine turn guilloche, uh, all across, and uh, uh, which is a uh, um, which is uh, which has also indices applied Roman indices and the famous fleur de lis um, hands that are a signature of Chapek uh, as well. Okay, we're going to go for the second watch and we're going to go not crazy this time. Although this is very nice, we're going to keep the absolute crazy number until the very end. Schwartz Etienne collection, there is an absolute pearl, which is the, uh, uh, the Roma Synergy collection, which is a very understated, elegant, but exclusively manufactured timepiece. These 20 pieces have been uh, um, equipped as you can see, with a two-tone dial that is grey on the outer outer ring, and is actually terracotta inside in uh, both the inner inner dial and 
the uh, sub dial, the small second sub dial. Uh, this piece is a piece uh, we are really proud um, about. We had a great, uh, a great response, and we think we have only the last pieces available of the twenty. Uh, pieces run so i thought it was worth it to share with you and to give uh, an over an overview uh, for you and your and your audience if you're into kari vutilainen's work this is a piece that uh, holds uh, a f- you know part of vutilainen's signature and work and eye and taste for aesthetics because it's actually an official collaboration between Forsetian and kari vutilainen you can see at the back there is actually the signature of uh, uh, kari one of the uh, loveliest Ooh. you know uh, gentlemen out there in uh, in in watchmaking uh, so considering a six to seven years waiting list for any curry booty line and time piece this is a kind of a of a, of a little uh, you know um stratagem to be able to yeah exactly shortcut to be able to to enjoy some of curry's work and um cheat code yeah and you know i use the term shortcut but the shortcut is definitely not in terms of a uh, the the elegance and the richness in all the um, details that this uh, um, this timepiece is actually uh, showcasing. As you can see, um, the decorations are you know from the snailing on the um, on the barrel. You can see pretty much at eleven o'clock uh, to the uh, uh, the work on the rotor, which is actually a micro rotor both on the surface of the rotor and on the perlage at the base uh, of the rotor itself. And it's a kind of a sun rays uh, um, decoration that, that starts uh, from the balance wheel and um, spreading out on the rest of the, of the case back. Uh, really, really uh, good work and, uh, and precious work because uh, you don't, as I said before, uh, it is quite hard to get any of Kari Vutilainen's work uh, these days as uh, the man is completely uh, oversubscribed. Yeah, and I think from this view, you can really appreciate the, uh, the color. It's taken ages to find the right uh, terracotta um, uh, great uh, because we didn't want to just do another salmon salmon dial so we wanted something slightly richer some something slightly more intense and uh, of course working on the two different patterns of this guilloche uh, dial and sub dial uh, we have managed to create uh, some nuances that uh, i find uh, pretty pretty original together with the wavy as well guilloche that you see on the outer ring okay and we've left what is my favorite till last this is a watch that i've seen across the globe again no pun intended if you're looking at the youtube video or you're looking at the show notes to see what we're talking about here this is a half a hemisphere so tell us all about this one yes this one is one of my favorite pieces uh, when i i really discovered trilob the french watchmaker thanks to this uh, timepiece they have other editions like the nuit fantastique for example that i find really fascinating but with uh, this une folle journée which is french for a crazy day um i think trilob has, have really managed to express their experimental view on uh, on watchmaking which is uh, mixing with uh, codes of uh, you know uh, if you want contemporary art uh, from a visual perspective but at the same time a different way of functionally uh, displaying the time as you are showing here here you have a dome uh, an actual dome with three um, uh, concentric kind of concentric circles but they start they both they both uh, uh, derivate from the same center point uh, more or less at uh, at uh, five o'clock for uh, you know if you if you as you're watching now uh, and uh, they showcase in good order the hours the minutes and the seconds it looks a bit uh, complex if you if you want if you're not familiar to look into it but there is a pointer actually that you can see on the watch um on the on the hour scale that is showing uh, basically is indicated both the hours and the minutes so actually once you get the gist of it it's very very quick and very easy and natural to actually be able to tell the time so this is an escamotage an excuse a way 
uh, to kind of uh, build a see-through uh, timepiece with the accent on this eccentric, it's called eccentric uh, caliber that is visible, yes, from the dial as you're showing here, but of course also from the back. And the layout of this um, proprietary movement is also quite uh, uh, sleek and sharp, uh, very well finished. And um, yeah, and Trilob are also great uh, uh, value proposition because besides the full journey, which is uh, position at a slightly higher uh, in price, but uh, mm, uh, notoriously, Trilobe timepieces for the, the value, for the level of finishing and for the uh, uh, originality of the creative process are really great uh, value for money pro proposition, in my humble opinion. Well, my quick question would be, what is the time as displayed just now, Pietro? Yeah, so no, la, if you look at the red pointer, you can see it's just past 12 o'clock and it's pointing at 25 as well, which is the minutes in that situation. And again, Ricky, try to explain to a child how to read the time with the two hands, what we consider the easy way of telling the time. Actually, is not is not the most natural. It's just conventionally the one that we decided to keep for our civilization, basically these days. Well, we've tried to cram three amazing time pieces into our allocated time, and I don't think we've done them justice. So I'm going to have to tell people to look in the show notes. I'm going to have to tell people to go to your website to look for more information, the tech spec, the info, how to get a hold of you, how to get a hold of these time pieces. Because apart from this little guy here with the almost metallic salmon dial. These other two I have seen before and they need a little bit more attention. So yeah, there'll be lots of pictures in the show notes. Thanks to Ms. L. And we'd fully recommend that everybody goes across to the limited edition website to find out more. And we're going to end the show on a bit of a somber note because it has not been the greatest of weeks when it comes to people that we know have worked with and in one case actually had featured on the show. So we have to bring the sad news that Brian Griffin, esteemed photographer, uh, partner with Arage as a brand uh, in regards to the Lensman 2 watch sadly and unexpectedly passed away a few days ago. Really sad news, someone who was just such a talent at what he did, way beyond watches in the world of photography, one of the greats, whether with regards to music or classical photography or landscape photography or cityscapes Everything and anything was Brian's sphere and he was a master of his art. So very sad to see Brian leaving us, but he leaves us with a huge body of work that will definitely ensure that his memory lives on into the future. This is usually the part of the show where we tell you to go through our back catalogue and have a listen to some of the most recent episodes that maybe you've missed. But in this instance, I would say go back and actually have a listen to the episode with Brian because it was really good. It is not boring. He has got so many things in his past, so many big brands he worked with, so many pop stars, singers, actors. He worked in Return of the Jedi. We talked about that, tied it in with May the 4th last year. And the other bit of bad news was if you live in Scotland or perhaps you were into a certain type of music back in the 90s within the UK and a little bit further afield, Northern Ireland, Australia, etc. There was a group called Ultrasonic that kind of kicked into the rave scene here in Scotland. They were based in Ayrshire. And the frontman from that, Malorca Lee, he came on to Facebook maybe a month ago to announce that he had been given a terminal diagnosis with cancer and he had mere months to live. He only managed to, to live on one month from that and passed away just a few days ago. So in Scotland, he was a part of my kind of upbringing. I was into that kind of music. I started DJing that kind of music. And uh, yeah, both guys taken far too soon. So a bit of a somber note, but we wanted to pay our respects to both gentlemen and tell you guys to look in the show notes. There'll be all kinds of information on both of them if you want to read more. And I believe there's a Just Giving page for at least one of them to help with cancer research. So that is us. That's the end of our show. Check the show notes. Follow us on Instagram. We are at Scottish Watches. Drop us an email. Do not DM us. Info at scottishwatches.co.uk. And we will be back next week. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you guys again soon.